So agree or disagree. There is potential power at your fingertips when you are young. Do you agree? As a young person, do you feel like you have potential and power and influence? Do you think you have those things? Yeah. I'm hearing yes. I'm hearing no. The Bible says so. The Bible says so. In is that in first or second opinions? No, I don't know where it's, I read it. Once. I read we're gonna get there. I bet. I bet we're gonna get to that verse you're thinking about tonight. Here's the thing. I think I agree. I think I agree. It might not always feel this way, especially when you're younger, right? Because you know you got your parents kind of still telling you what to do. Sometimes, like I don't know, growing up in my house, sometimes I knew I was right about something, but my dad would be like, "No, no, no, you're not right." And I was like, "But, but, but, I, I think I'm right." Look, so here's here's some stuff that I think is really cool about um, the power that I think younger people in society have. Um, consider these. Consider these. Teenagers and whoa, young adults. Influence what music and movies top the charts and win awards. Like what you guys stream, what you guys find cool and popular, that's what gets, that's what gets the most attention. Um, this generation, your generation, spends $143 billion a year, which means that you have massive influence on the way companies create and market and what kind of products they're selling. Companies are marketing to you. They want to sell you stuff. You're like, me? Yeah. All those unboxing videos, all those like, all that stuff you watch and consume online, all the ads, it's all personalized content. You have influence over what companies do. Um, when I think through history, it was people close to your age who were sitting in, um, in the sit-ins during the civil rights movement in the 1960s, right? It's teenagers today who are advocating for uh, more social responsibility. Um, teenagers today saying like, hey, we don't like gun violence in our schools. Teenagers today saying, hey, we got to do better things to protect our environment, right? Think about this. Lewis Braille was 15 years old when he invented Braille. You know, the language that people who have um, vision impairments use to be able to read and communicate. 15 years old when he developed that. Totally changed the world as we know it, didn't he? So you get the point. There's been, you know, th this phase in your life really comes with endless possibilities, but it doesn't always feel that way. You have power to influence the way that the world works, to invent tools that might make life better for others. You get to fight for change in areas where you see injustice. That's a lot of power, and as Uncle Ben once told Peter Parker, with great power comes great responsibility. Comes great responsibility. You, guys, you guys are good. But come on, you know this. We feel it. We feel it every day. You know, you know what? You got, you've got potential. The world, you've got possibilities laid out for you. You've been told you can change the world. That probably feels really hopeful, and sometimes maybe it feels like a lot of pressure. You can't deny young people are powerful. But now I want you to think about the power you have and the influence you have, especially when it comes to your faith. When it comes to faith, I think some of us feel like we're being underestimated. Isn't it true sometimes that while the world feels like it's full of infinite possibilities and excitement, sometimes... Faith doesn't always feel as exciting or world-changing, right? When it comes to faith, sometimes I feel like the only thing we ever challenge younger people to do is show up to church, sing songs, and hopefully you can sing on key. Um, maybe talk to your friends for a few minutes. Repeat the same thing over and over every week for 52 weeks. Like, is that what faith is supposed to be? We just show up and do that one hour a week? Is that all there is to it? I think some of us feel like we have these low expectations to just show up when there's a lot more potential. Some of us feel a different way. Some of us, it's not that we feel that the expectations are too low. We actually feel that there's a lot of pressure, that following Jesus comes with a lot of pressure to get things right. I just hung out with a student um, not too long ago, looking back on their high school career going, you know what? I, I feel like I could have represented Jesus better. I think I could have followed Jesus better. I think I could have talked to more people about Jesus. I felt like I could have set the better example. He was looking back and feeling regret, feeling a lot of pressure, feeling the way that he lived could have been done better. Um, maybe that's what it feels like to you some days. Um, showing up feels like a lot of pressure. And when you can't show up to church, you feel guilty about it. Maybe it feels like a lot of pressure to follow the rules, that it seems like, hey, Christians are supposed to live a certain way, and there are certain rules we got to follow, and it feels like a lot of pressure to keep all that and never, never mess up. Maybe it feels like being a Christian is a huge burden instead of something that brings a ton of joy and freedom. Maybe you're brand new to this church thing, and you look at church and you go, yeah, I can see how 
and how quickly people fall into those categories. So it's, it's, it's kind of strange that I think every area of life for us feels like it's full of power and possibility and influence, and sometimes church doesn't always feel that way. I think that's a problem. So is Christianity supposed to be a life like that? Is it supposed to be a life where, hey, we just got to show up and check out? Is it supposed to be a life where we feel the burden of pressure and performance? I don't think so. So the question I want to ask tonight and that I want to explore through this series is, can faith be bigger and better than the version we've been handed? Can your faith be better than the version you've been handed? To help us answer those questions, we're going to spend some time the next few weeks looking at a gentleman from the New Testament who's named Timothy. If you've grown up in church, you've probably heard that name. Um, he lived a few thousand years ago. He was a leader in the early church. Jake, we got that slide on who's Timothy. Perfect. Thank you. Um, he was a, lived a few thousand years ago. He had a Greek father and a Jewish mother. Um, if you know anything about our New Testament, you know that could have brought some conflicts as they had different beliefs. Um, Timothy was mentored by Paul. and He's mentioned in many of Paul's letters, sometimes even as a co-author. Paul writes, hey, from Paul and Timothy. Timothy was right there doing, doing amazing, amazing work. Um, Timothy had spent about 15 years with Paul, uh, being mentored, traveling around, being equipped as a leader uh, in, the, in the early church. Um, so he was a missionary. He was a church planter. And he was a pastor. He was a young leader, or at least younger than the people who thought they knew what they were talking about. Um, and uh, he was the recipient of at least two of Paul's letters. Uh, we have those in the New Testament. We call them First and Second Timothy. And when we pick up in First Timothy, we find out that Timothy is a pastor in the church of Ephesus. Um, Ephesus is in modern-day Turkey. This church doesn't exist in this state anymore, but Timothy was there, and he was leading this church. And we're going to jump in today, which I think it might be the most famous verse in all of youth ministry. And you're going to find out why here in just a second. Um, we're going to use it as a launch pad for our series. So in 1 Timothy chapter 4, I believe it's 4. Yes, it's 4. i got to get there in my own notes. All right. Um, yes. 1 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 11. Paul writes to Timothy. He says, teach these things and insist that everyone learn them. Don't let anyone think less of you because you're young, but be an example to all the believers in what you say, in the way you live, in your love, your faith, and your purity. And until I get there, Paul's wanting to come see him, until I get there, focus on reading the scriptures to the church, encouraging the believers, and teaching them. Bella, was that the verse you were thinking about? Right? Don't, don't, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set the example, right? So we're going to break these down for a few minutes. We're going to talk about what they mean and how we can apply them before we go to small groups tonight. So we pick up in verse 11. We're kind of in the middle of a conversation. Paul says, teach these things. What things is Paul talking about? Well, he's talking about everything that came before from chapter 1 all the way up to chapter 4. And Paul had to write to Timothy about some pretty tough stuff that Timothy uh, had to lead and encounter in his church. Um, he, Paul talks about the gospel, right? That Jesus came to save sinners. If you don't know that, that's the good news, and we'd love to talk more about that with you. But Jesus came to save sinners. Paul talks about people whose faith has been destroyed and that they believe false teachings and they walked away from faith. Um, he compares it to a shipwreck. That's how messy it was. Um, he gives Timothy instructions for worship in his local church. He talks about who can be a church leader and who can't be a church leader and what he should do about false teachers. So Paul writes these instructions to Timothy and says, I'm writing to you now. Even though I hope to be with you soon, we can find this in chapter 3, I, I'm writing to you now, even though I hope to be with you soon, he says, in case I'm delayed, in case I'm delayed, I want you and your church people to know how to conduct themselves in the household of God. This is the church of the living God, which is the pillar of truth, 1 Timothy 3, 14 through 16 says. Did you catch that? How we conduct ourselves as Christians, what we call the church, demonstrates the truth about Jesus. How we live, how we function, what we say and do demonstrates the truth of the gospel that Jesus came to save sinners. Paul continues on to verse 12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but be the example to all the believers, the younger ones and the older ones, 
in the way you live, your life, your love, your faith, and your purity. So let's pause for a second. How old do you think Timothy was when Paul was writing this letter to him? How old do you think Timothy was? Shout out your answer. 20s. 13? Okay. 20s? 18? 25? 25? 15? Okay, good answers, good answers. And why I ask that is because for a long time when people read this and they see the word young, they assume teenagers. Because, right, like, this is like... The youth group burst. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. Um, and so people kind of assumed, like, hey, he's a teenager because it has the word young in it. Um, but actually, Timothy, Timothy would have started following Paul when he was somewhere between 16 and 25 years old. He was a teenager or young adult when he started following Paul. Add on the 15 years he spent with Paul, Timothy is at least 30, if not 40, and potentially older, Nicole. You could, you could be right. And so you're like, okay, if he's 30 or 40, like, that's kind of ancient, right? Like, he's old. If you say yes, I'm going to be so disappointed. No, no, right? Um, Timothy could have been that old when Paul wrote this. Here's the thing. Why, why is Paul saying, Timothy, don't let them look down on you because you're young? Because in Paul and Timothy's culture, being 30 to 40 years old was still considered young. Not only from just an age perspective, but also from the perspective of how much wisdom or experience you could have. And so Paul encourages Timothy here in verse 12 to keep reading and teaching the scriptures and encouraging the believers. I mean, put yourself in Timothy's shoes for a second. Imagine you're him. And it's his job to teach the older people in his church how to follow Jesus. He has to teach some pretty hard truths to some older people who already have opinions about how this should be done. He has to tell them what they can and they can't do. He has to tell them what wise choices look like and what unwise choices look like. And I imagine that people had expectations of Timothy. People looking at Timothy saying, just wait, he's young. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He'll mess up. He'll prove that he doesn't know what he's, what he's up for here. That he's not qualified to be a leader. And so they're just maybe waiting. How would you feel if you were Timothy? Having set the example for older believers and feeling maybe that pressure. Instead, we have Paul, right? One of the top leaders of the early church who says, Timothy, don't let them expect less of you. Don't let them expect less of you. Don't let them look down on you. Instead, set the example. Don't let them set the bar too low. Set the example. Rise to the occasion. Be the leader. Lead the way in how to follow Jesus. Lead the way in what a transformed life looks like. Lead the way in being able to give wise advice. Lead the way in how you follow the scriptures and how you serve and how you live it out. And why would Paul tell Timothy that? It's not because Timothy's a rock star with like all kinds of like charisma and like He's got all the right gifts or strengths. Yes, he has gifts and strengths. But it's because Paul knew something that was true about himself, that it was true about Timothy, and it's true about every believer, including you and I, and it's the power of the Holy Spirit. Check this out. In Romans chapter 8, verses 10 and 11, Paul writes, And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. Don't miss this. The Spirit of God, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, now lives in you. And just as God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Paul knew this was true about himself. He knew it was true about Timothy. And he knew it was true about every person who follows Jesus. And so Paul says, because you have the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that could raise Jesus from the dead lives in you. Now, because of that, you set the example in the way you talk, in the way you behave, in the way you love others, in the way you trust God, in the way you set healthy boundaries, and in the way you have pure motives and actions. Not only this, but Paul knew something else to be true of Timothy. And in Paul's second letter to Timothy, he explains it like this. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, five, Paul writes, I remember your genuine faith, for you shared the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I know that the same faith continues strong in you. Paul recognized that Timothy had great examples of faith in his life. 
with his mom and his grandma. And that they had a strong faith and that it was real and that they passed it on to Timothy. And yes, Timothy had to like take that on and live that. But then it says that he, he made it his own. It was genuine for him. He didn't just do it because that's what his mom or grandma expected him to do. He didn't just do it because, well, Paul's my mentor and I guess this is what I have to do now. Timothy had a real relationship with Christ. And it transformed him. And he grew. Yes, it may have started out as a copy of what he was taught from his mom, his grandma, and from Paul. But it became a faith of his own. We can describe this as Timothy taking steps to own his own faith taking responsibility for it, making it a priority, nurturing it, exercising it, growing it. So whether we think Timothy might have been underestimated by others or overwhelmed by pressure, Timothy understood that his faith had to be his own. He had to lead out of understanding his own relationship with Jesus and that he could set the example. He took it personally and he took the steps to strengthen it. And this can be your story too. As we start out this year, and I've been thinking about what's our, what's our theme? What are we going to come back to this year? I want us to be a people who own our faith. That say, you know what? Yeah, I might be here because you know, this is kind of what I've always done. I kind of maybe grew up in the church, or my parents brought me here. Or, you know what? Maybe I'm not even sure why I'm here, but I found myself here tonight. You can own your faith. You can grow your faith. You aren't meant to have a go-with-the-flow faith. You're not meant to have a Sunday only while you're at church kind of faith. You can know Jesus. You can have a relationship with him. You can follow his example and his teachings, and you can become more like him. So I've got a few ideas of how you can begin to own your faith. This is not a, a, a all there is to it kind of list. This is just a few ideas that I've thought of that you could start with. And we're going to explore more as we go throughout this year. But you can start by exploring what you believe. Every one of us has started with a faith that was passed on to us by someone else, and that is good and it's right. It should be. That's how we make disciples, by sharing our faith with someone else. But it can't stay someone else's faith. And so we have to begin to explore it. We have to ask questions. We have to wrestle with it. We have to look at it and, 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 and say, what, is this, what does this really mean? And how do I apply this to my life? I, I encourage people, you know, I might be the one up here teaching every week, but just because I'm teaching and I have a microphone, don't just take everything I say at face value. I want you to take what I say and go to the scriptures and explore it for yourself because I want you to grow. I hope that I handle God's word rightly. Uh, it's a passion of mine. I've studied it. I love it. And I want to pass it on to others and do it in the most authentic way possible. But I also want you to own it and ask questions. People like your small group leaders, myself, we're here to help you, but we can't own your faith for you. So explore what you believe. Secondly, Move to an everyday faith. It's easy to get into the habit of showing up on Sundays. We know we need to show up at church. It's good for us to, to sing the songs, to go through the motions. But for some of us, that might be it. And those are great places to start. We need to be in church. We need to sing the songs. We need to be in dialogue, having conversations with our small group. Um, but it's not the only part of our faith. We're meant to have a Monday through Saturday faith, too, where we can live out the teachings of Jesus where we can share Jesus with others. Every day we get the chance to set that example. So maybe moving to an everyday faith means starting, uh, starting an everyday faith means like, I'm going to make it a point to connect with God daily. What does it look like for you to do that? Third thing you can do is you can invite, invite others in. Explore your faith with other people. Yes, your faith is personal and you have to own it, but you were never meant to do it alone. Others can't do it for you. Your faith wasn't meant to be private or isolated. We were made to follow Jesus together in community. And so your small groups and your small group leaders are a great place for that. Um, join in the discussion. Ask the hard questions. Go on that journey with those friends to build a faith that you can own, not just one that's based off what people hand to you. So as we start the new school year, I want us to enter into it with this fresh and renewed perspective. What does it look like for me to own my faith? What steps can I take to own my faith this year? How can I grow? What do I need to start taking maybe a little bit more seriously than I have in the past? Your junior and senior high years are a great opportunity to set the tone for what the rest of your life can be, to build the habits that will help continue to grow your faith. You can know Jesus. You can have the full life that he promised. 
So as we head into small groups tonight, our first night back of small groups, um, you know, uh, we want to make sure like you're getting to know the people in your group, you're getting to know the leaders. So we don't want to like jump ahead of that because that's really important for us to connect uh, before we can ever have really meaningful conversations. Um, so in your small groups tonight, we're going to go there next. You're going to get to connect with those people, get to know them hopefully a little bit better. And if you've still got time in your small groups by the end of the night, your small group leaders have some questions that just maybe start us thinking about what does it look like to own our faith. So final question for us as we go there tonight, the question I want us to be thinking about is when it comes to your faith, what's been your perspective? Where have you felt underestimated or overwhelmed? What's been your experience with faith so far? I'm going to pray for us. We're going to head to small groups. And uh, after small groups are over, that'll be the end of our night. We don't come back in here or anything. Uh, so small groups, you're going to connect. You'll hopefully discuss, pray for each other. And then um, we'll get out of here, and we will see you guys back next week. But I'm going to pray for us now. Father God, um, God, we're grateful for your work. Thank you that um, you have teachings from Paul written to Timothy that we can learn from. God, real people who were figuring out what it looks like to live and own their faith in their time. And God, the timeless truth of your word passed down. Trustworthy. We can know it. We can believe it. And through knowing it, we can know you. God, would you help us to know you better? And that as we continue to grow our faith in you, that we would own it, that we would take the steps to grow it, and that we would overflow it into the people and the areas of our life, people who need to know you, people that we can set the example for, people that we can share our faith with. God, would you help us do that tonight and this year? Father, be with us as we head into our small groups now. Um, God, would you help us to make those quick relationships um, to get to know the people who are in our groups? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, friends, we can go to groups, and um, we'll see you back here next week.